We're trying to do something of making self-employment sustainable in Africa. So this booming economy of freelancers and gig workers and subcontractors, and we want to make that economy sustainable by providing a platform to businesses to manage and pay um, freelancers and subcontractors at scale. Tulani, welcome. Thanks for having me. So I start the podcast with a question, and the question is, who is Tulani? So I think Tulani is a failed creative <laughs> that turned into an entrepreneur. So really passionate about art and music and a lot of other stuff. And I think that passion for creativity manifests itself in entrepreneurship because I like to build stuff and try things out. So tell me, tell me a little bit more about your history, kind of where you came from, your background, and how you kind of got to where you are today. Uh, yeah, so I have two parents that are both entrepreneurs. So I think various things that they got us involved with early. I think the first thing my dad ever did for my brother and I, and he bought us like back then when you had to like sell airtime through a proper traditional thing. So he bought us one of those and would sell like airtime vouchers. I think it was. I must clarify with my brother, but on my grand street, and we're doing well. My brother, my cousin and I and my gran, she asked us to shut that down because she was involved in like parliament and things like that. And she didn't want us pursuing business ventures. Uh-huh. And yeah, fast forward, it also helped out my mom. She has a shop in a small town called Malamlel in Limpopo and would also help out on the counter. So I've always been involved in entrepreneurship, at varsity or selling t-shirts. So always really passionate about entrepreneurship and business. And then I went into corporate by studying at Vitz Business School. I wanted to like dig deep into this thing. And back then I felt that I needed a degree to be an entrepreneur, but that's something else. And yeah, I was a management consultant and afterwards ended up starting another company and starting this company that I'm focusing full time on now, which is Moya Money. So tell me a bit about Moya Money. What is it all about? So we're trying to do something of making self-employment sustainable in Africa. So this booming economy of freelancers and gig workers and subcontractors, and we want to make that economy sustainable by providing a platform to businesses to manage and pay um, freelancers and subcontractors at scale. So it's a very simple platform where they simply onboard them, um, verify their details like ID and things like that, and then they can pay them through our platform. And what makes us different is freelancers and subcontractors can request an early payment on an invoice. So no longer waiting 30 or 60 yeah. or 90 day payment terms. So it's a very interesting business model. Um, are there many competitors in South Africa to what you're doing? I think within verticals of our business, yes. So there is maybe like payroll solutions or there is invoice factoring solutions. I think what makes us different is the network effects, pairing the two together and then the early access payments as well to unlock cash flow. Okay, so it's really interesting. So you obviously subsequently then got uh, recognized in the Mail of Guardian for under top 200 entrepreneurs in South Africa or top 200 South Africans and then the entrepreneur category. Um, Talk to me a bit about that. How did that all come about? So it was actually really, it was a surprise to me because I think to be part of the MNG Young 200, you have to be nominated. Yeah. So I just woke up one morning and a family member told me they had nominated me. Um, that was actually nice in the sense that it was like kind of encouraging that someone would actually, within my close family, would be like, I'm actually really proud of you and seeing what you've been doing. Um Here's a nomination and obviously ended up being selected. But it was really cool as well just meeting a lot of really young people that are actually doing really cool things. And also just being part of a community, I think as entrepreneurs, we're typically in business circles, but now you're interacting with people in civil society or maybe health and medicine, and they're trying to obviously push the barrier there. So it also broadens your scope to realize success or really setting high standards of what South Africa and Africa looks like. It's not just limited to business. Yeah, 100%. That business circle is super important. And I imagine after that, you met other entrepreneurs who are maybe not doing the same type of business, but are obviously very much in the same age vicinity. And I think it's it's uh, it's quite interesting meeting people like that, because sometimes you get to network and find new opportunities, etc, etc, etc. So how long has uh, Moya Money been going on? 
So we started investigating the problem around tw- end of 2020. Mm-hmm. And I think my co-founder and I, Sabika, went full-time in 2021. So it's been about actually only two years. <laughs> it feels longer than it has been, but it's only been two years. That's business for you. Yeah. Okay, so obviously this must have required a lot of capital raising. And I think I read a story that you went overseas to do that. So talk to me a bit about that. Yeah, so with the first version of the business, we bootstrapped, and then we were, I was about to say lucky enough, but yeah, we were lucky enough to have been selected as the first South African fintech to participate in a fintech incubator called F10, now they've rebranded to be called Tenity, and yeah, we went to Spain, and we at least got a little bit of incubation capital to get the idea to a prototype, and then we closed some angel funding um, to actually take that prototype to market. So what is the process for people I know of going and capital raising? Because it's quite difficult. I don't think it's as straightforward as people think. Um, so what's the process to it? What is the process that you applied? I think you first need to look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself if you're sane. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredibly hard. I think like before we actually went about that process, we obviously spoke with other entrepreneurs and they told us it's hard. And then we're like, okay, but we can pull this off. But I think to simplify it, number one, you just have to ask yourself, like, why you're raising capital, what you're raising capital for, and how you're obviously going to use it. And as business owners, once when you figure that out, it's pretty much then um, building a kind of sales funnel to identify what type of investors would be interested in that business. So typically, entrepreneurs, we like to also waste investors' time by just reaching out to every investor, but not every investor is interested in financial services businesses in Africa. So you kind of have to hone down that list to a specific niche. I would recommend actually crunching it down to about a list of 200 investors. Even just building that list of 200 is a lot of research, a lot of like sieving through fintech reports or funding reports in Africa. But once when you get that list down, you then have to identify how you're going to reach the 200 so probably realistically 50 60 percent of them you have no relationship with Mm. in terms of anyone in your network knowing them so you know you're going to reach out to them in some type of cold email or linkedin dm then you start figuring out okay cool people within my network most probably other entrepreneurs i think that's probably the most underestimated resource amongst entrepreneurs just seeing your entrepreneur friend and saying, hey, you have a connection with this investor, would I be able to get an intro or an introduction meeting? You can probably meet about 20% of investors that way. And the other last 10 to 20% is just grinding. So trying to figure out pitch competition, showcases, um, other investors in your network, if they can also do intros and just putting yourself out there. And it just creates this type of momentum where one person might put in a bit of capital. And once you get that first capital in, you try to create that FOMO that like, okay, the round is going to close. You don't want to miss out on an opportunity because ultimately that's what investing in a company is. And I feel like as entrepreneurs, we don't treat it that seriously that I'm giving you a piece of this asset and this is an opportunity for you to get involved. So I'm interested, you know, obviously this has got to do a lot with freelancers. What type of uh, freelancers are being connected with businesses through the platform? So the early adopter market we looked at was the creative industry, mainly because a lot of work in the creative industry is gig work. So photographers, videographers, extending to makeup artists and the likes. And that's where we initially focused in terms of launching or we still are in the process of launching the platform. And then now we want to start expanding that to other industries. So professional services um, and other industries where... People, even just outside of the industry category, I think we are also heading towards a remote work world and flexible work. I think with those dynamics changing, even traditional industries like consulting might use a lot of freelancers to deliver their project work. Okay, so how do you go about vetting a freelancer? You know, because obviously I think um, I I recently went through the process of hiring a few employees and... um, I noticed when I was doing these these or looking through these LinkedIn applications, um, it can be a little bit deceiving what if people actually can do what they say they do. So I mean I've worked with freelancers before for photography and videography needs. Um, 
So how do you go about vetting these people to make sure that they can actually do the job that they are requested to do without it hurting your brand as a net result? Because I can only imagine if you link a business with a freelancer and they do a terrible job, they're going to blame the system and say, I'm not using this again. So we currently have actually niched the product and business down to actually not necessarily focus on recruiting. We actually go straight to the clients and they tell us which freelancers they want to onboard. Okay. So that also makes the legwork slightly easier for us because they tell us what criteria they need to vet a freelancer. So most often than not, we've actually seen that the vetting, once when the recruitment of the freelancers is done, the vetting is actually just figuring out if they may be VAT compliant or tax compliant, BE compliant, if it is a black owned business, vetting them against ID and banking details. So I think it's a bit easier the way we've positioned the business because they essentially just say, we've brought these freelancers on board. We just need to onboard them compliantly so that we can pay them compliantly as well. So it's obviously based on providing self-employment to people. So I'm interested to know, in your mind, what is self-employment? Because I think nowadays um, there's a bit of a, a line that needs to be drawn in the sand between what it means to be a, a business owner, an entrepreneur, as they call it, um, and self-employed. Because it's not necessarily the same thing. Um, so you know, what's in your mind to be self-employed? I think self-employed is kind of like how I would have seen my own journey previously. Maybe I was a consultant working at like a management consulting firm. And instead of working for a firm, actually just deciding to work for myself. So straight up same process of project delivery or doing like a piece of work on a larger project. But instead of doing that as someone who's permanently employed, doing it within my own capacity. I think the difference between that and a business owner is I think business owners also have ambitions to scale, mm. meaning that eventually I might want a team to handle certain aspects and grow this business and increase revenue. But you typically find with self-employed people, they're actually pretty happy to just work as individuals. Maybe I might have a virtual assistant handling certain tasks or outsource accounting to an accountant and things like that. But they pretty much in their own individual capacity, doing work that they previously would have been doing, but just as individuals. So, yeah, I think in many ways, especially in South Africa, um, everyone pushes entrepreneurship because of the fact that um, it can be quite difficult to get jobs. So in that regard, everyone's saying you need to become an entrepreneur, but in actual fact, becoming self-employed is perfectly fine because you're still able to earn income without having to necessarily get a full-time job. Um, and I think that's what scares people off a lot of time is they, they don't end up going and learning a skill like photography or videography or video editing or consulting or whatever it is. And they're more focused on what business do I need to go start? And then that's why they say I think it's 90% of startups fail. Um, and I think partly because of the fact that those people who are part of the 90% maybe aren't entrepreneurs by heart and just want to have an, their own income and their own control of their time. What's your what's your opinion on there's something we talk about in the podcast a lot on being self-employed versus being employed? You know, there's a differentiating factor. Both have their pros, both have their cons. Um, but what's your take? Yeah, I think the the first thing is that there's kind of this notion that or let me rather say self-employment has a bit of a negative connotation mm. in the sense that it's kind of like exactly as you've mentioned it. I think in South Africa we kind of view it as like the employment market, permanent employment market, and if you weren't able to get a job, ah, you're unlucky, so now you're forced to be self-employed. I think when you speak to a lot of self-employed people, you realize they're actually some of the most disciplined people out there. The discipline to wake up at the same time every morning, like six or seven. Um, obviously, the discipline to deliver without like a boss or the threat of losing your job. And I think in terms of self-employment, what I do respect about a lot of people that are self-employed are those characteristics. And I think that's what a lot of people don't look at when they consider self-employment. I also think psychologically and mentally you also have to be strong in the sense that you're not necessarily sure what the future might hold. So in a company, you might have a 12-month contract. You typically make the assumption for 12 months you'll have cash flow unless you deliver terribly but when you're self-employed even if you're delivering super well 
if there's no project, sometimes that's just not down to you. Like you could actually have good relations with your clients or the work you've done has been at a very high quality, but sometimes you just have to deal with the fact of, okay, in this month there's no project, but they say there's going to be a project next month. So you kind of have to have that mental strength to kind of like be able to deal with those blows because I think mentally it actually can grind you down. I think the last thing as well, I've noticed on my own entrepreneurial journey, but also just from reading books that if you are self-employed or a business owner, even a CEO of a company, I feel like the one skill that's underestimated is financial management. Mm. And I think when you're self-employed, because your cash flow is inconsistent, you have to be creative that maybe your friend in a company might earn 40K a month, you might earn 300,000 upfront. So you readily have to have a good budgeting strategy to allocate that capital. And it's similar in a business. Ultimately, you're just making capital allocation decisions. I think that's why Warren Buffett is where he is. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think uh, in any business or in any if someone is self-employed, they often don't manage their finances correctly. And then that's part of the reason why money gets blown away because you make, say, three, four 400,000 rand and then you think, oh, okay, cool, I've got all this money, let me go spend it. <laughs> and then three, four months down the line, you've got nothing left to show for it. Unfortunately, uh, that's part and parcel with financial education. You know, I've spoken quite strongly about um, the education system in South Africa, I mean, all around the world, actually, and how it's so outdated. And it was actually designed to teach you how to be an employee and not designed to teach you necessarily how to live life properly. Mm-hmm. So as a net result, we don't get taught in school how to file taxes, submit returns. Uh, You don't get taught how to budget your finances. We don't get taught any of the actual life skills that would be quite helpful and end up causing people to get into a lot of trouble. Even when we talk about debt, debt's another one. You know, a lot of of people go to the the bank and I've had this already where the bank will offer you ridiculous amounts of loans and they'll tell you, oh, you have 30% interest rate, for example. And you'll think, okay, cool. So they offer me 300,000 rand. So 30% must mean I only have to pay back 30,000 rand. But obviously nobody's been taught properly what compound interest is mm. and how important it is. Or they'll go to surety on a loan. And often the financial education is just not there. And then as a net result, people get into a lot of trouble. They overspend. They to take out loans and debts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of what's your take then? Maybe also, you know, I, I went to study overseas. So never studied locally. Mm. But I'm interested to know as well, um, what's your what's your background school wise? What type of school did you go to? Was it private government? And then when you went into the actual university system, um, I think you mentioned I thought I needed a degree to become an entrepreneur, but as a net result, maybe you realized that wasn't the case. So what's your kind of take on the whole system? So I do think I agree with you that uh, there's a lot to be done in terms of like financial education, and I think as well we also look at financial management as something that you need to be an accountant or an investment banker to understand, but yeah. you don't need to understand like discounted cash flow and you know mergers and acquisitions and these complicated things to be able to manage money. I like I forgot the full author's name that like managing money is more of like a psychological habit than it is like an actual skill where you have to understand the technicalities of it. So in terms of the education system, uh, primary school, I went to a government school. High school, I went to a private school. Then I went and studied a BA in international relations and politics at WITS. And then I studied a PDM at WITS Business School. And yeah, for my own background, looking at it, I actually don't really have a finance background. Mm. Um, I think for me, it was just around 2021, I became really interested in like business one, but investing as well. And I started really seeing the merge between the two that the most successful entrepreneurs also kind of look at how they manage their business as like a type of investment thing, especially like we're mentioning Warren Buffett, like a lot of CEOs, even Patrice Mutzip, they kind of have this group structure and they end up thinking about it as like, I invest in this business and grow it. So it ends up actually becoming an investment process we really look at it, but at the individual, personal level and business level, the foundation is, as you mentioned, just budgeting. So how much do I need for expenses? I think one of the first pieces of advice when I was getting mentored as an entrepreneur 
um, was actually by a former CEO of a financial services provider, a large one in South Africa. And he, when we were building the business at the earlier stage, he gave like advice that I still remember to this day that the first version of your company is actually you calculating the expenses you need to get started. And I think a lot of us look at business from the revenue perspective, but to actually yeah. get it off the ground, you actually have to look at it from the cost perspective. And once when you figure out how much you need to get started, the financial management is really just making sure each month you're budgeting month on month to just make sure there's cash in the company. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think um, it's it's something that we often have to learn the hard way. When I started my first business, I made so many financial mistakes. I spent money on things I shouldn't have spent money on. And I also overpaid for things. But fortunately and unfortunately, it was my education, school fees. And I was in a position where the fact that that had happened, I could recover from it. But unfortunately for other people, that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where it gets really difficult. So I remember from my first experience when I, when I did my first business um, when I was around 18 and I made all these financial mistakes. It was like, okay, cool. It's n not going to make or break me. But like I said, if in regards to other people, it can sometimes. And that's where the concern comes in because people then go on these entrepreneurial ventures they make all these mistakes, then they fail at this business and they think, flip, I can't be an entrepreneur, I can't start a business, I clearly don't have what it takes. But the reality is you often fail at your first business and you often make a lot of mistakes at the beginning. It's just about bouncing back. So I always wonder, um, what's the best way to educate people better? I know there's a lot of guys um, you know, who, who preach about business and why you should be, and I'm one of these guys who I always say, you know, look into the business route self-employment route before you look into the job route mm -hmm. see if you have what it takes because it does if you can get it right it provides you with a better lifestyle um, and maybe you get to do what you enjoy more but get into it early and don't wait till too late because when you make those mistakes often you need to have a recovery plan so i always i always find it interesting i don't think there is enough knowledge being spread to entrepreneurs about this stuff i mean some people don't even know how to register a company Mm. You know, where's the where's the entrepreneur crash course? Um, where's the start your own business crash course? And unfortunately, we do need it in South Africa because of the fact that we just cannot generate enough jobs for the amount of people we have. So you almost have to push people in the direction where they can learn to do these things. I, I've done a podcast recently with a guy, um, Winston Kunene, and he won 40 under 40 in Africa for real estate. And he's got this company called Libertalia. And part of their whole organization, it's a real estate company, is an um, education platform. It's 200 grand a month, and they teach you everything about becoming a real estate agent. And then obviously you can go through their agency, do your whole candidacy, and then become an agent. But that's job creation. Mm. There's not a lot of that. That's the education that you often don't get. Um, I'm interested to know, you know, with your, with your business career, did you make a lot of mistakes at the beginning, or were you like really strongly advised? Yeah, oh, tons of mistakes, even at Moya Money. So I think the first couple of mistakes that I made on my business journey, so I think like the first kind of business that kind of had consistent cash flow, not a lot, but for me it was consistent, was in university when I was selling T-shirts. And I think the biggest lesson I learned there was just exactly what we're talking about, budgeting. So the first mistakes I made is as soon as cash came in, I didn't really have like a plan yeah. of how to manage the money. Other mistake I made was just me running the business. So I didn't have kind of like a plan. Like let's say, for example, I was selling T-shirts in and around Vids, but started getting interest from people in Pretoria and Hatfield. So would have to like hop on a car train to go and like deliver T-shirts. And not figuring out things like um, cost of sales, like not accounting for the cost of a car train ticket. So it became like a thing of like a heavy burden where I'd be getting all these orders and I didn't also have like a system to manage like sales. Like yeah. it was all, I mean, shirts is very informal, WhatsApp based and people being like, yeah, Tilani can print t-shirts for you. So there was no proper formal structure, and I think those were the first lessons I made. Uh, sorry, learned. Moya Money. Actually, we initially started with um, helping freelance with financial management and helping them access financial products. Okay. And the big lesson we learned there early on, because we actually made a big pivot from B two C to B two B, was just around product demand. 
But I think it was good we made that decision early and didn't fall into the usual tech startup tra- um, trap of just building something no one is interested in. And I think we learned pretty quickly that you can have all these wild ideas of how you're going to change the world, but if the demand from customers is not there and they're not willing to pay, you already have a problem. And I think sometimes we also personalize our businesses, meaning that just because this is something I would use, everyone else is going to use it. And I think, yeah, there was a lot of learnings around, like, the product there. And I'm actually glad we pivoted because I think my co-founder and I learned, like, so many lessons. And even when we do chat to, like, our angel investors and, like, these mentors I am telling you about, like, the respect they have (laughs) that have just been just grinding it out and didn't give up during that phase and found a way to, like, turn things around when it was really a challenging start to life in the, the tech space. Yeah, uh, tell me, because I have been fortunate enough to have a lot of mentors and meet some very successful people, and I've often noticed a lot of common traits amongst them, especially when you speak to them about their business careers, entrepreneur careers. Um, and I'm not so much talking about these traits of being able to raise capital or you know, being tech savvy or whatever it is. I'm talking more traits where consistency or persistence, et cetera, et cetera. And I look at these guys and... I think people will look at successful people and they'll say, oh, well, he got lucky or uh, he caught a lucky break, whatever it is. But they won't necessarily look at the behind the scenes because often they don't know it, which is why getting people on a podcast and hearing their story in more depth is often refreshing because you, like I, I always say one of my favorite entrepreneurs is the CEO of Gymshark, Ben Francis. Mm-hmm. And he started this thing as a university student and, one thing led to another, and now it's a billion pound company, biggest fitness clothing brand in the world. But what's interesting about that is he's done so many podcasts now where he tells you more about the story and all the mistakes that were made in the hard times. And you never really hear that side. But when you get to meet these people, you get to see that side. And it mm. almost is very refreshing because you know, like in this stage of life where we're at, the possibility to get there is possible as long as you stick to the same key fundamentals, consistency, persistence, et cetera, et cetera. So tell me, you know, with your experience, and I'm sure you've been fortunate as well to be around a lot of successful people, have a lot of mentors. What what have you noticed that is kind of proven to be a thing that has made people successful? So I think you can break it down into like similar, like what you're saying, things that I've noticed amongst like my mentors and like, people that have backed out business early is the first thing is like there's this almost don't overestimate the world and underestimate yourself so kind of like that steve jobs notion of like everything in the world that's built from spaceships to these mics is built by people just like us and we look at a lot of things that are built and a lot of products and services and we think they're really complicated and they require like a deep sense of knowledge but the first thing i've noticed with a lot of them they just jumped straight in even if they didn't have the expertise they kind of back themselves and you'll often find you can figure out that industry and the problem quicker than you think that was the first thing i think all of them um have kind of like a process for clearing their mind so some people it's meditation some people it's cycling some people it's exercising but you kind of realize with them that if you can control your thoughts you can kind of control everything else because you happen to life life happen doesn't happen to you if that makes sense and i think once when you have that like sense of control kind of like what michael jordan would like explain it that even within like a storm in the ocean deep within the water still. And I think they have a process that when everything's crazy in a business, because it does get crazy, that you can remain still and like can actually like analyze the world as it actually is. The other thing is exactly that, like persistence. I think when no matter what you do, you're gonna face like a stumbling block. It could be a competitor, it could be yourself. Sometimes we block ourselves from our own success. But I think having like a strategy to overcome that. And I think the last thing as well is just purpose. 
Mm. I think that's one that's underestimated on entrepreneurship. You actually realize a lot of people are actually purpose-led and they want to see a better version of the world. And I think that purpose is what keeps them going during the tough times. Because I think if it was just for money, I think a lot of people would actually quit. But that thing in the back of their mind just keeps them going. That like, this is the vision, this is the end state I want to get to. And even if today is tough, I know that I've still got a very long time before I get there. So they're able to put their hardship or even success into perspective. So I wonder, you know, it's always interesting to find out from people how you got to becoming a businessman. So in my case, I was born into a family like that, where you, my father was in business, an entrepreneur. So it was a, I don't want to say a natural progression for me past, because I was an ex-athlete and then I decided to go into the business route. So I don't want to say it was a natural progression, but it was a lot easier because of what I was around my whole life. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's quite nice to hear from people what their stories were like. So I'm interested from your side, did you grow up in a very business-minded family, maybe more working class, maybe more having jobs at uh, banks, whatever it is? What was your kind of background in that regard that pushed you in this direction? So I think both my parents were and are small business owners, so uh -huh. not like massive business you know <laughs> yeah but small businesses that were able to send us to good schools um look after us and i think also just teach us lessons like i think one person i really respect is my mom just like her work ethic like i joke around with people that like my mom will outwork you you know <laughs> and i think from seeing how hard she works um i realized that's what it takes because i think she was a teacher and I think from becoming a teacher, she obviously started her like small business, which is now, I guess, grown. And I think just seeing that journey, I've realized what it takes to actually get to where you want to be. But I think, as I mentioned, just helping her out, um, doing small tasks. I think that's one thing I recommend to anyone. Like if you have parents or even a close family member that's in business, even if you have to do, like, let's say your family member owns a catering company, just go help them wash pots. Like, on that journey of helping them do small things, like, you learn so much of unseeing and observing how they maybe manage their customers, how they manage, like, sales. And I think you pick up those lessons that you can take on your own journey. Yeah, it's, it's something that I've spoken about. If I could go back in time, I would have done a lot more internships. Um and I think the reason I say that, because now I'm learning so much from working with people, but I could have easily have learned those lessons a long time ago if I had taken a bit more initiative when I was even younger than I am now and gone and done internships in my holidays and worked at corporations. And it's like you said, sometimes you'll just be a pencil pun uh, puncher or you'll just make the coffee, but it's not so much about what you're doing work-wise, it's more being in the environment and seeing how a business is run. So I think that's highly important. And I I hope that it's encouraged more. I must say, though, as a young businessman, I often go into meetings with people who are older, and it's a flip of the coin whether they're going to show you a shred of respect uh, because of your age, or they might just show you so much respect and be so kind to you and offer a helping hand. So it's really a flip of the coin, and unfortunately that is the probably the most hardest part about being someone who's young and trying to get into business is you want to be in these rooms with these people and learn, but you never know how they're going to react. So I hope that in that regard, it is at a place where someone can knock and go to the reception and just say, is it possible for me to come get an internship here? Because I know it's so rich to say it's so easy to do it, but the reality is you often need an introduction but if there was more programs or easier ways for people, like I said, just to show up at the front desk and say, how do I become a free intern? Because that's, that's no burden to a company. Often free interns are good things. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested to know, you know, I always ask people these questions about South Africa. There's, a, there's obviously the elections coming up um, and there's a lot of divide. I come from a background where a lot of people I know want to jump ship and go overseas. And personally, I did the opposite and I came back after being overseas. I always tell people, I think, South Africa's problems are fixable, but other countries' problems are not fixable. 
Um, so I'm interested to know kind of what's your take. I think they asked you a question in the Mail and Guardian. Um, what's your what do you want the next five years in South Africa to look like? Someone asked you a similar question. What do you think the next five years will look like? But maybe even what do you think the next twelve months will look like? So I think we are obviously in a very tough environment right now. I think I believe that like history in general, like is kind of like a pendulum swing. And I think things are going to get slightly a bit worse before they get better. And I think that's just, we need to ask ourselves personally, like how much worse are we willing to let it get? But I think we're about to see post that it getting worse, the real blooming um, of South Africa. So I'm very optimistic. And I think South Africans in general, and I'm sure maybe you've noticed this, it's just a certain culture of optimism in South Africa that things are going to get better. But I really do envision a future, number one, of tech. I think tech makes such a big difference in any country, just in terms of you just like study classic economics. Like if you're able to bring efficiency in industries mm. and unlock productivity, it has returns on the general economy. But outside of that, I think the big things we do need to fix is education, is healthcare, and obviously bridging the huge inequality that does exist. I think that's like an elephant in the room that we need to actually figure out, okay, cool. We've been having this discussion for a long time of inequality, and we know it needs to be done, but what can we actually do to start bridging that divide? Because I think if it reaches a point where inequality just keeps increasing, 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 it's just going to be a recipe for disaster. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think um, w one of the worst things that is often projected is division in terms of people not wanting to work together because of racial reasons or because of even BEE reasons a lot of the time. I think that's one of the best and worst things that was ever introduced as an example because of the fact that its purpose is correct but its net result is incorrect and in turn why i'm saying that is because sometimes it negatively influences who you want to work with why you want to work with them um, and i do find in the business space you know i've been very fortunate I've, I've got a lot of business partners who i i trust i work really well with and the relationships are there and i must say i do see in the business space there's like you say a lot of inequality um, and there's a lot of backlash for certain people working together and ultimately the reality is the the future of South Africa lies mostly in the age ranges of say 20 to 35 call it your younger generation mm -hmm. because these are the people yourself and me included who their businesses need to do well in order to grow the economy increase GDP etc 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 um so there needs to be a way to push them in the right direction. And like we said, one of the things is education. Mm. Getting better educated on running a business and not making the mistakes that cause you to fail. But also avoiding just starting Soma any business because you think it's a good idea. Often when you think something is a good idea, I always recommend go Google it because maybe someone else has already done it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot that needs to be done. And I personally believe that uh, the next elections are going to be very different to what we're used to. Um, anything can happen, you know, depending on where the votes go. There's, uh, I mean, I've, I've heard quite recently that the last election, I think 50% or less of South Africans who can vote voted. So that's already something that we sh it hopefully can change, get more people to vote. And then ultimately, uh, one thing I've always noticed about South Africa is regardless of what happens at, say, the next election, um, people are very resi resilient and they just get on with it and they're very adaptable. So even take an example of the lights at the at the, the robots. I mean, they've been out for how many years now? It's been ages and we've just become so adaptable to it and gotten used to it that ultimately it's become reality. Obviously, we're not happy about it, mm -hmm. but that's the thing about South Africans. Change will come and we're very quick to adapt to it and get on with it. Um, but at the same time, I, I, you know, you hope that good things come and good things are on their way and that more people like yourself get recognized for their businesses and get help and funding and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, what's, what's your take then also on businesses being the key to success in the next, say, five to ten years? Yeah, I think we as business leaders also need to recognize that I think society has shifted in the sense that, like, 
so much of society kind of hinges on how businesses operate nowadays. And what I mean by that is that businesses just used to be about producing goods and services and chunking out pro- profits and shareholders take those profits. But I think now society, which is good, has been pushing companies to also realize that these businesses are actually part of like an ecosystem and the value they create actually pours back negatively or positively to that society. So I do think in terms of leadership as well, we also need to look at ourselves and hold ourselves accountable to realize that when we create these businesses, it has like a type of effect on the rest of society at like the material level hiring people allows them to you know buy cars and go to pick and pay to buy groceries and obviously that grows the net of gdp and everything else but i think outside of that we need to also realize that businesses have the power to make people feel seen so obviously we have this unemployment crisis so if you hire a grad now it's maybe even searching around for a job for like a year that makes such an impact on their lives, that makes such an impact on their families and just other areas of life. So I do think one of the catalysts for change in South Africa, and I think we have seen it, like we've seen extraordinary organizations being built like Discovery. Mm. I think if you look at Discovery as a case study and you look at like Patrice and a lot of his businesses, these are actually businesses that don't just make money, but when you look at the output, the output is actually positive to the communities. You know, uh, we were speaking about it the other day. Like, you obviously Sanders played football, but Mama Lodi Sundowns, you know, it's actually had such a positive impact on people in from Pretoria, from Mama Lodi, from South Africa, and it's just such a good use case of what a proper run organization South Africa can actually do for the rest of the country. And I think when we start as leaders of businesses, creating businesses in this way, I think it does have a filter on effect for the people that work for us because ultimately when most often than not when you do start a business your first 10 to employees are probably going to start their own businesses because they were so close to you like that's how a lot of people start businesses typically so I think when you also look at it from that perspective that your early employees are going to be watching you you know studying you you're going to realize that they're also going to go pursue their own thing. And if you hopefully were a good leader with good ethics and principles, you can maybe inspire someone else to make a transformational type of company. Now that's very powerful. And it's a very good way of thinking and thinking about it where your business needs to have a bigger impact than just making money. So I like that. Going back to Moyo Money, talk to me a little bit about what your day to day is looking like at the moment with regards to the business. So right now we're in a position, so three focuses. So product development, we're now building our MVP. So we want to do like a big bang launch. You should look out for it first quarter of next year. So just really working with design and engineering teams to build that. So a lot of like my day to day is like getting really close with my co-founder, like breaking down our ideas into a tangible project product, sorry, that will bring value to customers. Sales, I focus a lot on sales. So I laugh about it. I'm like a used car salesman. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like selling left, right and center, LinkedIn, email, you know, attending business events, networking. But that takes up a lot of my day. And then also just closing our fundraising. So we're now closing a pre-seed round of investment. So just working with the various stakeholders to get that over the line. So I think fundraising, if it wasn't for that, think i'd be living a much more comfortable life but it is a lot of hard work to get investment into a business how long would you say the fundraising has been going on for so currently this fundraise has been open for about two months but i think based on the global fundraising climate we've also just realized it's going to take a lot longer to close so vcs are no longer deploying capital as quickly as they used to i think just in general a lot of people that would typically be in the angel investor space, I think are also a bit more savvy with their money because it's a tough economic climate. Because I think when you're trying to, I mean, VCs kind of have a mandate to invest in startups. So having those conversations is not too difficult. But with an angel investor, you realize you're competing with him, maybe buying his new car or getting a new house or maybe putting the rest of 
disposable income so his kids can go to school or whatever. So I think we have, in general, a lot of entrepreneurs have been talking about how the funding landscape has changed. But I even think because we're in an enterprise industry, even large enterprises are cost-cutting on a lot of things. So it's not as easy getting a sale as it maybe was two years ago, a year ago. Yeah, it's very true. I think um, South Africa is a very difficult place to raise capital because people are very scared of investing in businesses. And that's, that's obviously where the VCs come in, especially, and hopefully help assist that. I've always said that it would be nice. I know there are government institutions that do provide capital, um, but it'd be better if some taxpayer money was allocated more so towards that because that could help a lot with boosting the economy, essentially. And you hope that that money goes into the right places and they're you know, this company, Altfest, um, that I did a podcast with Warren Wheatley, they invest in SMEs particularly, and it's like a bank, but for SMEs. And I thought it was a beautiful concept, brilliant, because of the fact that the barriers to entry are a lot lower for the capital raising. Obviously, you need to meet the specific requirements and it needs to be a good idea, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where they guide you as well. But that ability to access that cash to be able to go and explore this idea with the correct guidance is, is very important. And there's not enough of those. Um, even when it comes to investors yeah it's just um, they'll give you their money yes but they might not give you the guidance that comes with it Um, and uh, you know you think you hope that it gets better over years and that raising capital I mean after I'm I'm on my own capital raising journey at the moment and it's it's very difficult it's very difficult not not easy at all people I think people underestimate you don't just go to someone and say can I uh, get x y and z from you and they say yes sure no problem it often takes a lot of meetings um, and even when they say yes, it's not like, okay, cool, I'll make the payment by the end of the day. It's, you know, it, it takes time. So um, it's it's good that you've managed to become successful at it. And uh, I think that's why it's also important to share that with other people so that they get an understanding that it is possible and that uh, I, I think people think that you have to come necessarily from um, a good background with good connections to go do that. But it's not always the case. There's opportunities out there. You just really got to be persistent, be consistent, and really want to do it and go all, all the way out. So what does the next five years look like for you? What are you envisioning? So, oof. Or even the next 12 months for you. I know we spoke about South Africa. I'm more interested now in you, you more your money, mm. the whole concept. You know, I'm sure you've got at least like a 12-month vision of where you want to be, even five years if you do. So yeah, 12 months, we're really trying to build it into a business where we can have 100 clients on our books and really start thinking about expanding outside of South Africa. So I'm not sure if this is just one of my personal things that I'm pushing on myself or it's just a thing that all tech startups think about because we can obviously scale globally easier than most businesses. Yeah. But I really am passionate about and envisioning this as a company that can impact Africans. So yes, South Africans fall into that bucket, but I really do want to build a business that I can see in Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya, and Uganda. And I think sometimes as South Africans, we get criticized that we lack the ambition to be able to visualize our businesses being there. And I personally want to hold myself accountable to say, that is possible. Like we're in 2023, there's more than enough technology and resources and networks to figure out how to get there. It's just about seeing it as like a vision that you kind of see in your own mind. So that within the next 12 months, setting down the foundation for that. I also want to see myself personally as an entrepreneur. Um, I always say that the thing that drives me as an entrepreneur is that I want to be in the Champions League of Entrepreneurship. So wherever the best entrepreneurs are in Africa, even globally, I want to be part of those networks. So if that means being part of some of the global fellowships out there, that means studying abroad, not necessarily for a master's or MBA, but wouldn't mind being part of like a short-term like Ivy League or major European university program for entrepreneurs, but I do want to position myself globally for myself and my own company. But outside of the hard material stuff, I just think big thing for me now is also peace of mind Mm. and closer spirituality with God and heightened consciousness. I think we live in a world of like noise, you know, 
And I just want to be in a position 12 months time where I'm just still um, happy with myself, happy with the work I'm doing and making an impact in what I am doing. And, uh, and finally, just in terms of more money, how can people find out more information? What do they need to be on the lookout for? That kind of stuff. So you can find Moya Money on www.moya.africa. You can find us on LinkedIn by searching Moya Money. And you can find us on Instagram too. And in terms of what to look out for, so you can actually demo our solution right now. You can go to our website and you'll be lucky enough to have a meeting with this guy. Yours <laughs> truly. Take you through a demo. But what we are planning is the live launch of our product. And you can look out for that in the first quarter of next year. But in the short term, we are actually looking at, we used to have these, and we still do have them, events called Coffees and Convos, where we bring freelancers together and businesses and connect them. Just exactly that. Like the idea was that if you could pick someone's brain over coffee, that's the platform we wanted to create. So we are looking at like, can we maybe create another event to bring people together? Because I think a lot of people did actually find it as something valuable. And I think we're probably going to do an event maybe before the end of the year. But if not, you can look out for our launch next year. Yeah, that's, I like that idea a lot. The, what do you call it? Um, Coffees co and Converse. Coffees <laughs> and Converse. That's cool. That's cool. That's smart, especially if we're just getting people to network. But uh, Tulani, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. And thank you for talking about all your experiences and whatnot. And um, if you are interested in everything, if people might go, go check out the website and Instagrams and LinkedIn's and whatnot. And uh, thank you guys for listening and watching. See you next time.